So I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank John and Sarah, who's here, for their continued support to the biomedical engineering. So this is the sixth uh, lecture in the series. So the first, first one started in 2010. And this year, so we are honored to have Dr. Joseph Desimon come to deliver the sixth Maruni Bryan lecture for us. Uh, Dr. Desimon is a prolific inventor, serial entrepreneur, and eminent scholar. So he is the chancellor eminent professor of chemistry at the University of North Carolina and also the wedding <coughs> Canon Junior Distinguished Professor of Chemical Engineering at North Carolina State University. Uh, Dr. Desmond has made several important contributions to the advancement of medicine. So one example is in early 2000, he developed this a new drug eluting cardiac stent for treatment of cardiac disease. And the stent actually dissolved itself after the artery has uh, recovered its own function. So, and that's being uh, used in many uh, medical procedures right now. And he has <coughs> so published uh, more than 300 scientific papers. And also he has uh, 100, more than 150 patents in his name and with 80 impending. So the, the number of paper to number of patent ratio, it, it's just amazing. And, and it's not surprising, he's also founded several companies, including Micell Technology, uh, Absorbable Vascular Solution, Liquidia Technology. And currently, he's on leave from university to lead his new company called Carbon 3D in Silicon Valley. Um, so Dr. Desimon is one of the few who has been elected to all three branches of National Academy, the National Academy of Science, Academy of Engineering and Institute of Medicine. He's also a member of the American Academy of Art and Science, a fellow of the American uh, Academy of Inventors. And he has received over 50 major awards. And I can't name, list it all here. I just want to point out several. So one is the uh, NIH Director Pioneer Award and uh, the five uh, half million dollar Levinson MIT Prize for Invention and Innovation. And he's also received the uh, AAAS Mentor Award for his contribution to advanced diversity in chemistry PhD workforce. And he also received uh, another prize, a John Scott Award for given to the most deserving men and women whose invention have contributed in some outstanding way to the comfort, welfare, and happiness of mankind. Uh, so I will stop here and please join me to welcome Dr. Desmond. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, John Sarah, for your support, and it's great to uh, be here. Um, I wish we had more seats for people. Uh, feel bad. Feel free to work your way down. Uh, it's wonderful to be in California. Um, I've been here now since July and uh, really enjoying the hospitality and the great weather and, and all the entrepreneurial things that happen in California. So it's great to be here. Uh, so I, I thought I would share with you um, a little bit of a thread of an idea and how we've extended it into a lot of different areas. Um, and, um, and so feel free to holler out if you've got questions. And I, I thought it would be useful to give you a sense of how we've extended some ideas and, and opened up some new areas. And I really like to work at the intersection of, of science and, and engineering and medicine, but also do it in a way that's translational. And I, I really enjoy uh, our research group that tries to, to bring all that together. And that's sort of the culture we try to cultivate. Um, and it's sort of reflected in all the different uh, appointments. That way nobody knows exactly where I'm at. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I can be less accountable uh, that way, as, as I'm fairly unemployable. Uh, so the, the thing about um, 
the privilege of being in academia is you get to work on, on what you want to work on. And, um, and the opportunity, especially at a public university, uh, like University of California Davis or University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, is doing it in a way that really is focusing on benefiting society. And we have so many places where uh, we, need to, we need to move the needle, uh, whether you think it's about infectious diseases or, or energy, all sorts of different areas uh, that we can have an impact uh, and trying to focus on some of the big problems. And I love this quote uh, from Henry Rozovsky, who was dean at Harvard. Research is an expression of faith and a possibility of progress. The drive that leads scholars to study a topic has to include the belief that new things can be discovered, that newer can be better, and that a greater depth of understanding is achievable. Research, especially academic research, is a form of optimism about the human condition. And I think that really epitomizes what, you know, the opportunity that we have in academia to, to, to work in these areas. And, and in particular, um, you know, I had the privilege of chairing a National Academy's uh, study on convergence. And this is the idea of all these different disciplines coming together. The biomedical engineering community gets this. I mean, it's part of the uh, DNA, uh, pun intended, of uh, <laughs> biomedical engineering. But, you know, not many places do this well. And, you know, MIT will talk about the convergence being life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. Um, you know, I would, I would argue that it goes far further than that. It includes the social sciences, humanities, and the performing arts. And you think about what's happening in design and, the, and, and visualization arts coming together. Uh, it plays a really important role if you can bring all this together. And a lot of people believe this is, in, in fact, a blueprint for innovation. If you can get this convergence right. And why this sounds, uh, and the young people, like it's like a no-brainer, everyone should do this, right? But at universities, we have sort of an 18th century org chart uh, that keeps these things separate and siloed. And it's one of the few, it's ironic that entropy is one of the few places that, or one of the few things that doesn't work on a university campus. And you know, mixing doesn't happen very well. And so we really have to fight through these, these barriers. And what's interesting is what's happening in the private sector, and you look at, you know, companies that get this right. I love this iconic photo of Steve Jobs, you know, talking about, you know, how it's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's, it's married with the liberal arts, married with the humanities that yields this result that makes our hearts sing. And Apple's got, you know, did this really well. And so, you know, you pick up your iPhone or your, or your Mac, <coughs> and there's a lot that goes into that, um, that really it's a, almost a cult-like following, and, and it's transforming the way we live, and we think about, how we live and the impact that Apple's had on that. And, and it's not just technology, it's really understanding people. Um, and I thought given the entrepreneurial nature of this lecture, uh, I thought that you know, one of my favorite new books now is Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One. This is a great book and he talks about you know, this, you know, what important truth do very few people agree with you on? And if you think about that, that's a, that's a really important uh, point to, to reflect on, but if you're an academic and you have a very important truth that few people agree with you on, you can't get that funded. That's really hard to get funded. And uh, but it's right where the most innovative things should be happening, right? Um, and so this opportunity for blending uh, academia and entrepreneurship, I think, is an important uh, way to move forward. And so Peter talks about this in the context of zero to one progress versus one to end progress. And the idea is that these, you know, the answers to this important truth that few people agree with you on is a zero to one idea. And uh, and given the challenges of getting things funded, uh, you've got to think about entrepreneurial ways to get these things funded because it's hard to do it through traditional academic funding mechanisms because you're really convincing people of a plan to build a different, uh, a different future. And so, you know, some of the keys that Peter talks about, um, you know, things that are 10x, things that are network effects, where product becomes more useful as more people use it, uh, economies of scale get stronger as it gets bigger, and branding. And so you're going to see elements of this, some of these, I hope, in what we try to do, um, and how we try to focus our attention. And the brandings one is, is important too in, in academic research. I, uh, I, I love Jim Collins's book too, Good to Great, and it's one thinks about where does one want to play and how are you going to win. 
in your academic research, Jim talks about you know, three lenses. And one of these lenses is, you know, what are you passionate about? You know, what, what keeps you up in the morning or keeps you up at night? And to really think about that. And what do you think you can be best in the world at? Uh, not necessarily what are you best in the world at, but what do you think you could be? And, uh, and then the other intersection is the financial one. And, at these, and this is not just profit. Some people's profit, but other people, you know, Melinda Gates would say it's how do you get some really expensive vaccine into some of the poorest places on the planet? You have to understand those financial constraints. Uh, and in the middle of these three lenses is what Jim refers to as a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Right? And if you go through this analysis, you know, these are, you know, I think, I think people can be really strategic about where you work and, and what you try to get done. And, you know, we've had the pleasure of trying to do this and, you know, and we, we succeed at different levels and we fail uh, often. Um, but these are the kinds of things that drive my students and I and, and how we think about uh, the different things that we work on. And, uh, and, and what may not be so obvious is for us, we, we like to think about polymer science. And that's our, that's our tool that we try to apply in a lot of different ways. And so I'm going to sort of walk you, through, walk you through that. And for us, it's also been very translational. And, uh, and there's been some common themes as we try to weave different companies forward uh, in the things we do. And so I'm going to spend some time talking about what we do with Liquidia and uh, Carbon 3D, and I'll just spend a moment on uh, Blue Current. So I've been at this for a long time. Um, and uh, we started at UNC in, 19, in 1990. Um, and in those early days, we focused heavily on doing polymerizations in carbon dioxide as a solvent. And it was, a, it was driven by environmental interest, having an environmentally friendly solvent to replace water and organic solvents. But it also had a material science advantage, and the vis uh, viscosity of CO2 is extremely low. It's gas-like, even though that we were using it in a liquid state. <laughs> And we, we publish all sorts of papers using uh, CO2 as a solvent, making important fluoropolymers. These are cousins to Teflon. Uh, and doing that in CO2, we also made amphiphiles in CO2, things that could self-assemble had a CO2-philic domain and a CO2-phobic domain. And we synthesize other fluorinated materials. We refer to this as liquid Teflon. And we started making these in CO2. And, um, and what's interesting is I ran into Steve Quake at a, a Department of Defense program, and I learned from Steve what were the big material science issues in microfluidics. He seemed to be on the cover of Science every other week. And he talked about um, solvent resistance in microfluidics was a big deal uh, relative to silicones. And so we decided to take some of these materials, these fluorinated oils that look a lot like silicones, but they're perfluorinated, they don't mix with silicones. They're very hydrophobic and lipophobic. And we decided to be able to make these into microfluidic devices. This lab on a chip with a very chemically resilient uh, elastic uh, uh, material. Then we started watching what George Whitesides was doing in imprint lithography. And so there's a small pivot here uh, doing imprint lithography. And then we started realizing that we could use this imprint lithography to start making individual particles. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a trail. You can see a trail of evolution of ideas as we kept building on what we were doing. And, and this has turned out to be a big deal for our group. And so we end up making uh, molds that uh, are able to isolate liquids that are precursors to particles. And, um, and we use these and we have the precision of the microelectronics industry because you can lithographically define these cavities. And you can make individual particles using a roll-to-roll -roll process. And this has turned out to be a really fruitful area for our group. We call this PRINT, uh, Particle Replication and Non-Wetting Templates. And it's used to make particles, engineered particles, that have controlled size and shape and chemical composition. And, uh, and so for us, this is a, a fabrication technique. Um, that allows us to have a tool to do to ask other questions, and uh, and so we you know so we started down a simple path, and then we started to think about its application in, in medicine, and so uh, our group has spent a lot of time 
uh, focus on particles of all different sizes and shapes. And, and I have some of this uh, film here. Open this up. And um, this is a film that I just showed you that goes through that roll to roll process. And you can see the diffraction on that. It's a simple disposable film that allows a fleet of organic chemists to make particles of precision, size, and shape, uh, and do it through a wide range of chemistry. So, um, a, a couple of points. First of all, print. We, uh, we are about to publish the first paper on this work in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. And you know, back to branding. Um, we refer to this as, because of the fluoropolymer nature of this film, we refer to it as non-wetting imprint lithography. And the acronym for that was No Will. <laughs> <laughs> right? And we were about to send this paper out. We see, it seemed important to us. And uh, you know, I talked to Jason and Ben and, and uh, Ginger. So look, we're about to publish this paper and the acronym's No Will. And this might have some legs under it. And uh, that's not a good brand. No will. So I said, look, go think of a new acronym. And they came back the next morning all excited and said, uh, what about print? And I said, I don't care what it stands for, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was particle replication and non-wetting templates. We sort of force fit it. It's not technically non-wetting. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, back to think about people early in their careers and, uh, and to have a, a flag and something that people can refer to as print. Now, a lot of people refer to as print as one of the particle technologies out there. And so the importance of something as stupid as that becomes important for driving a lot of things. And so, you know, we've had a, a, a CCNE, a Center for um, um, Cancer Nan Nanotechnology Excellence, you know, the big uh, NCI-funded centers in nanotechnology. We've had one for 10 years. Print's been a big part of it. Um, and so that's, you know, the kinds of things that are, are really important. The other thing I would mention is these molds, this film I showed you, um, was spun out into the company Liquidia. It's raised, you know, $65 million or so, and it spent tens of millions of dollars to bring this to fruition, right? Because the particles, the first paper we published, we only made, you know, a, a few hundred particles, right? You, you couldn't even weigh that. Right? You, let alone do cell work, let alone doing translational uh, preclinical animal work. And so it was crucial to form a company that invested the resources to turn this into a continuous process so that we can now make gram quantities. And now the company's making kilogram quantities of particles so that we can be translational. And so this, getting this relationship right between academia and industry is really, really important. Because we couldn't have proposed the kinds of things we proposed without having the capability of moving things forward. And so this is a, you know, sort of a lesson learned in hindsight that this really propelled our group to really ask important questions that we couldn't have answered without the tools of a, an industrial affiliation uh, in our group. Um, and so this is now, you know, it's got a lot of legs. Print is now a, a CGMP compliant process at Liquidity. We've got products in a clinic. Um, and the FDA has been uh, very supportive of the precision of the microelectronics industry for moving these kinds of technologies forward. And so you, know, you can read a lot of our papers. I've, we've published a lot in this area. I don't want to spend a whole lot, whole lot of time on that, but um, I want to just sort of give you that, that flavor. Now, remember, I, these were the two polymers that were in that first uh, slide I showed you. And, uh, and I wanted to show you, and this polymer became the one that we did the imprint lithography with. Uh, another offshoot of this polymer is that this polymer is, is, is not only, as I mentioned, not only lipophobic, but it's hydrophobic. Right? It's a perfluorinated oil. But we had a discovery in the lab uh, that this material was miscible with polyethylene glycol. Right? And what are, the, what are the characteristics of polyethylene glycol? A lot of people have PEG. It's very water soluble. Right? It's often used as a, as a coating on particles. And, but it's very surprising <coughs> that a water soluble polymer was miscible with something that was a perfluoropolyether. And we can make materials that were, you know, you know all sorts of molar ratios of these two materials uh, that had crystal, made crystal clear films. They were miscible. 
And uh, so that was interesting. We, we had a, an oil, fluorinated oil that was miscible with a hydrophilic component. Well, this turned out that we could realize that we could start dissolving lithium salts because polyethylene glycol dissolves lithium salts. It's an important chelator. And we ended up you know, discovering that we could dissolve a lot of lithium salts not only in the blend, but also in the pure component, which you would have bet the farm against, that you could dissolve lithium salts in something as hydrophobic as this oil. And this turns out to be a really interesting electrolyte uh, for lithium ion batteries. And we have a startup in, uh, in Berkeley called Blue Current with Natasha Balsera, and it's a small company, it's just four people. And we're trying to bring forward a, a non-flammable uh, electrolyte for lithium-ion batteries. And uh, again, it's a thread of an idea that's following our nose a little bit, uh, that some of these things fell in our lap and we're you know, moving them forward. So that was, that's pretty exciting. And obviously, a lot of people would be interested in lithium-ion batteries that are non-flammable, including Elon Musk and, and, and other people. Um, but what I want to do is tell you uh, a story about this polymer and how it's opened up new horizons for us in, uh, in 3D printing, okay? Um, but before I do that, uh, in our company, Carbon 3D, I do want to put this in context. The, the print technology that I talked to you about, making an, imp a, 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 uh, an imprint lithography mold, we only today have about 12 different sizes and shape particles. It's very expensive to make a large area master so that you can make film from this. And you get about a, you know, in, you know, we've been doing this since almost 10 years, and we still only have about a dozen size and shape particles. You'd love to really explore a lot of different sizes and shapes, but it's hard to get at. It's analogous to, that this is like an offset printing technology and zeography, right? But there would be a lot of interest if one could do digital printing. Right? Because you just have it, you can rapidly change all the different sizes and shapes of what you're making. And so what I'm going to tell you about is more about a digital technology, and, and it's what everyone in this room knows about, is the power and impact that 3D printing is having uh, here at UC Davis in biomedical engineering, a beautiful lab uh, here dedicated to this. But around the country and around the world, the role that 3D printing is playing, uh, and it's really transformative to think about you can make some really complex things out of a, out of a printer. Uh, and complexity is, is free with 3D printing. It's one of the, the, the fundamental tenets of why this is so interesting. Uh, that you can make complex things that uh, are basically unfabricatable by injection molding or CNC machine, uh, things that would be very hard to fabricate. So that's an important topic. The fact that you can have unlimited design space and you know, we have, there's a lot of classes here at UC Davis on design rules in injection molding, and these are all the rules you have to obey that you can't make what you want to make, right? It's inhibited so many design concepts because of fabrication issues. Um, and the ability to precisely replicating things from a scanner, especially the things that are related to our anatomy, uh, teeth, uh, ears, feet, all sorts of things, the fact that it could be a compact portable manufacturing technology, uh, and this is a little interesting and maybe a little scary about zero skill manufacturing and the implications associated with that, and this idea that it's empowering to everyone. And so this is a you know, this is what the big deal is about 3D printing. And now I'm going to switch slide decks and go to something else here. If the scanner doesn't die on me. Doesn't look good. <laughs> Let me just try sort of yeah. right, this. I've never done this before. Okay. <coughs> At the company, we're using uh, KeyPoint. Mm -hmm. Keynote. Yeah, power, no, Keynote. And uh, I've been using PowerPoint my whole career. And I haven't been able to convince the market marketing people to go back to PowerPoint, so I'm switching. <laughs> and I've lost that battle completely. Um, we're really enamored uh, with 3D printing uh, for all the reasons we just talked about. But, you know, one of the issues with 3D printing, if you look at the different technologies, and you had many of them downstairs or right across the hallway, 
There's a number of different 3, 3D printing processes out there. There's FDM, and most of your printers are, a lot of your printers are operating this way. And this is basically an extrusion process. Um, heated material through a nozzle, um, and it's, it's a wonderful technology. It's, uh, it, it very effectively deposits and you use different materials. Um, there is a SLA process, a traditional SLA process, which would be a, a vat of liquid, and uh, you end up um, polymerizing liquid with photochemically and typically lowering products into a large vat uh, of chemistry. Uh, and again, it's got a lot of utility, and there's a number of different technologies out there for doing that. And then there's SLS, selective laser sintering. This is for powders and sintering powders together. This really works well for metals, an atomic solid, where there's no memory of the grain boundary between the particulates. But for polymers, the mechanical properties of polymers are derived from chain entanglements. And it's very difficult to get the chain entanglements between polymer particles like you do in the center of a particle. And so the properties often are not, are not great. Um, but, but are often really great for metals. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't get the feed outside. So is there anybody here who's running IT in the office? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Thanks. I didn't know there was a feed outside. <laughs> <laughs> feed. Does that mean they have food? We don't? <laughs> so should I pause? I wouldn't. I think so. Okay. Um, and then there's a couple of different sort of uh, deposition or inkjet like processing, uh, binder jet and, and uh, material jetting, and, and you have some of those technologies here as well, objet and, and others. But these are these technologies have evolved over the last 25 years. But there's some there's some common <coughs> threads here uh, in that this is 3D printing is actually a misnomer. This is not 3D printing, this is 2D printing over and over and over again. Um, and when you, when you really look at it that way, this is a celebration of mechanical engineering. I, I love mechanical engineering, uh, but this is mechanical engineering at its, at its best, right? It's really precision deposition multiple times over and over again. Um, but you know the opportunity about thinking about things differently, and again, backgrounds uh, of people. Um, the, the team that I was involved with um, in developing a new approach. Uh, I'm, I'm a synthetic chemist, as you sort of got a flavor of that, and I also work with a physical chemist and a, and, a, and a physicist. And like a lot of different ideas, often simple connections between fields are important uh, for opening up a new insight. You know, back to this convergence idea. And so the opportunity of having a new perspective in an in a, in a, in a in in existing field can be uh, a powerful advantage. Um, and so we were actually inspired by this scene out of uh, Terminator 2 <laughs> in T-1000. <coughs> this is the way a 3D printer ought to operate. Right? The idea of having an object arise out of a puddle really fast with essentially zero waste uh, in a continuous manner. And we thought about how would we actually get that to work? And it's almost a DARPA-esque like statement. You know, how would you try to get something to work that was inspired by Hollywood? <laughs> but take a step back and we thought, how could we actually have a puddle and craft something while we're doing a continuous renewal uh, of the resin. And the idea that you know, if you're crafting something, you need to maintain the puddle. You need to maintain a liquid phase while you're crafting at the same time. And so we, we certainly realized that we could kick off the solidification process with light, um, but, but that would just be the solidification process. And it's hard to attenuate from a bottom-up like approach that, that the, the positive formation of a solid with light only. And then if we needed to do this, we wanted to have, it didn't want that completely, we still wanted to have the liquid interface. And so what we ended up um, coming up with was a process that if we could pull this off, we could dramatically exp 
uh, speed this up. And so right now, 3D printing takes forever. People here set it up overnight, and parts come in in the morning. So if we had a process that could do this, we could, we could address the, the speed issue. If we could do this, we would also address the lamination issue. A lot of the mechanical properties are limited by the interfacial adhesion between the layers. And perhaps we could also open up new materials, especially if we're going faster, and open up new chemistries. And so our approach is to, is to use both light and oxygen to grow the parts. And, uh, and to realize that light and oxygen have very different roles. Right? Light is a solidification process. Oxygen is an inhibition, inhibition to the photochemistry. If we could spatially control oxygen uh, and light, we could work in unison and try to get this to work. And we're fortunate. Um, so again, back to entrepreneurship to sort of share some things with you. We've been working on this for two years. And we did three things at the same moment. Uh, we were fortunate to be selected for a presentation at TED. And uh, you can go and download uh, the TED Talk, and I encourage you to do that. I'm, I'm losing to Monica Lewinsky right now. <laughs> uh, so if you bolster my score, <laughs> she gave an amazing talk, actually. It was really uh, amazing. But the moment I walked on the stages of TED, the embargo on our science paper lifted. And uh, we happened to be on the cover, too, so that was pretty cool. Uh, and at the same moment, we, oh, we unveiled, our company came out of stealth. And so we did all that uh, together, and it was, it was pretty interesting uh, having that all at once. So let me tell you about our process. We call this CLIP. Again, you're going to see another branding kind of thing. Uh, you're going to see the, us pivoting away from printing, because we think this is not what we're doing. Right? It's production. We're growing. We feel like we're growing, so we thought about this. We call this continuous liquid interface uh, production. And there's basically three elements to this process in this machine. We have a reservoir that holds the pump from the, like T1000. Right? At the bottom of the reservoir is a very special window. I'll come back to that in a moment. We have a stage that lowers into the puddle and will pull the object out of the puddle. And then we have a light engine. In this particular case, it's a digital light projection system operating in the ultraviolet, 385 nanometer wavelength. And what we're going to do is we're going to play a movie coordinated with a z-axis displacement. But this window underneath is not only transparent to light, but it's permeable to oxygen. Okay, so we're going to now be having both light and oxygen come through the reservoir, and we're going to try to get the light to go further than the oxygen. <coughs> Because oxygen is going to inhibit the photochemistry, and we're going to try to pull all this together. And so if you think about this, if you had a traditional mechanical approach to this, and you had a, a window, and you lowered a stage and sandwiched an increment of liquid, maybe 50 microns thick, and you were to project a pattern through that window, you would have a polymerization front that comes from the window where the light's the most intense, and it would polymerize from the window to that stage and basically glue it down. Okay? You just made a two-dimensional image in the bottom of this uh, uh, reservoir. So the question is, how do you introduce ne the next light or more resin? What you have to do is you have to delaminate it from the window. And it's something that's fragile. It's, it's tens of microns thick. You have to introduce new resin. You have to reposition it. And you repeat this process over and over again. That would be a traditional bottom-up uh, uh, three-dimensional printing process. Okay? Now, in our case, <clears throat> the window is, is not only transparent to light, but it's permeable to oxygen. Okay? Oxi so it's like a contact lens. Right? And it's, it's a cousin to these, these fluorinated amorphous fluoropolymers that I just showed you that we made in CO2 25 years earlier. So, it so it's like a contact lens. Oxygen comes through that. It quenches the photochemistry right at the window. Okay? And so by tailoring the light intensity and the wavelength of light, we're able to do this in a continuous manner. We're able to pull up and suction forces bring liquid in underneath as we build these products and do it in a continuous manner. So what we're basically doing is we're trading now a, um, an understanding of some really important parameters such as the oxygen flux, the light intensity, the wavelength of light, the molar absorptivity of the resin, 
the dose to cure, the molar sensitivity in a polymer, and we're wrapping all of these fundamentals into some fairly sophisticated software to control the process. And it's also have to factor in the geometry because the liquid's got to flow in. Right? So it's a dynamic building process uh, that allows us to do this. And I'm, I'll show you a video uh, of, the, of the machine. This is what we actually did on the stages of TED. Uh, this is a little bit of a sped up video, seven times the speed. But you see the stage lower in to a reservoir. And uh, we begin playing a movie underneath. And the very first layers adhere to this stage. And then you just start to see it pull up out of the reservoir. You see this particular geometry, uh, the liquid's draining out of it. It's a little bit of a wicking that takes place. And you just see that drain as it builds up. Now, we, we actually did this on the stage live at TED. And uh, we shipped two machines up there. The first one didn't work. <laughs> uh, it got, it got you know, banged around in shipping. Um, but this thing uh, came right out, uh, right on cue, right on the stage. And people started applauding. Uh, they started applauding at the moment I put up Paul Flory's polymer chemistry textbook. <laughs> and I wasn't paying attention to what was being printed. And I thought they were applauding to the textbook. <laughs> I thought I was the only one that loved that textbook. <laughs> um, but this allows us to go really, really fast. And yeah? Um, how solid is that object that's pulled out? So that is a lattice, as you see there. But the density of the resin is on the order of common uh, polymer densities. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some more in a moment. Um, it allows us to go fast. You know, what's interesting, if, if you have a low impact strength version of this and you break it, and you see you, it, it's completely solid, but you see brittle fracture, right? There's no fracture mechanics related to the layers associated with the fracture. And if you look at traditional 3D printing, I should turn this over the other way, you can see the, letters der the layers derived from uh, the traditional 3D printing versus what we see. In addition, what's notorious in 3D printed parts is that the properties are anisotropic depending on the, on the orientation of printing. And, um, and, and we don't get that. We have isotropic properties. We have properties that look like injection molded parts that are not dependent on the direction or orientation of, of printing. Um, now this video is, uh, is not sped up. This is running in real time. And uh, you know, no one, no one will have the patience to show you a real-time uh, video of a 3D printer. Um, and if you look carefully, you're going to see some uh, wisp of vapor uh, happening here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. We're converting a lot of monomer to polymer here, and uh, polymerization reactions are exothermic. Uh, this is getting really, really hot. And we can drive these. These are running at uh, thousands of millimeters an hour. Uh, the X so as a chemical engineer, I'm pretty excited because we're now thinking about, we have issues of heat transfer to worry about. Right? We've taken 3D printers into that kind of regime. Right? So you think about the implications for doing that and all the new, all the new challenges that emerge uh, for you know, highly reactive resins and conversion in that case. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, images. So uh, my student, uh, uh, Rima, she's been uh, looking at the details of this process. This ramp um, is, is printed upside down. So imagine you're pulling it out of the puddle. Um, they're all printed at the same printing speed. Okay? So imagine if you have this ramp, this top one, and it's coming out inverted. And every 100 microns in Z, she makes the image a little bit smaller. She's just making the image a little bit smaller. She's pulling it out continuously. Okay? And so what happens is you see a staircasing on the edge. Because she, every, every, she holds the image constant for 100 microns in Z, and it makes it a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. And you get the staircasing. Well, she can change the image every micron, or every 25 microns. And you see what happens to the surface here. Okay? 
These are all made at the same speed. Said another way, if you try to do a 3D printer and go from 100 micron slices to 1 micron slices, you would slow your 3D printer down by a factor of 100 if you did it layer by layer. These are all constant. So inside, they look like monolithic parts. And you just see this is just an edge effect. Um, and we've mapped out, this is coming from the paper in science that uh, we published. These are the details of, as we change the, uh, the oxygen content underneath the, the film, we can change the dead zone. Right? We can work with ambient air or we can have pure oxygen and you can change the dead zone thickness. Uh, you can imagine from a rheology point of view, this is uh, viscous flow through parallel plates. And as you change the thickness, all that has got to get factored in. We also change the cure thickness by changing the molar absorptivity of the resin. So again, we can map out in, in fundamental detail all these parameters and wrap this up into uh, software to control this process. Yeah, this was the textbook that went out that I thought everyone was excited about. Uh, Paul Flory, this is a classic textbook. But as a synthetic polymer chemist, I, I, I think the other opportunity with a really fast process is we can now start doing, some, doing designing some really amazing materials. And this is probably the most important aspect of this story. Uh, it hasn't been told uh, really yet. But uh, you, know, you look at the properties of the resins that we're making. They have amazing properties. You know, this is a simple prototyping resin. It doesn't have a great impact strength, but it, you know, it's, it's what you'd want for a lot of different applications. But we have some amazing materials now with impact strengths that are exactly what you'd expect for our injection molecular <coughs> systems. These are amazing parts that have properties to be a final part. Okay? And, uh, and they have the kind of properties that you'd really want to have. And it's very tunable depending on what you're making. Um, this is, a, this is a, a living hinge. This is a polypropylene-like material made using this process. It's got four, uh, four living hinges. This is gimbal, uh, three, <coughs> three living hinges. And it's got a great, you know, again, the kind of properties you'd want in, in a range of applications. Uh, and then elastomers. There's no good 3D printed elastomers out there. Um, and we have amazing properties on elastomers. Uh, elastomers with high resiliency and high elasticity to high damping. Right? This, is, this, should be, this should be reversed. This is damping. This is resilient. Right? The idea of designing uh, <coughs> things that have the kind of properties for cushioning or O-rings or gaskets. In design, when people design a new gearbox or a new tool, one of the first things they do is they get out the book and see what O-rings are available. And they design a the device around the, the seals that are available. And so the idea of uh, making your own kinds of designs are really powerful. And then color is very straightforward, and we can match all the colors. And in the beginning, I didn't know how much color we could get in here because of this, this trade-off of absorption. But we now have it all worked out. We can give any color uh, that your heart desires. And we have a whole range of other resins coming uh, that we've been able to print. Biodegradable systems, um, <coughs> all sorts of really exciting uh, silicones and other materials using this approach. And so what I think this means is the opportunity in, in manufacturing is what, what I'm, I'm hearing over and over again is what happens is that people will have a design uh, and then they'll prototype it using the rapid prototyping tools. But because the designs, they first of all have to design things that they can go to the next step and manufacture. So they really aren't pushing design yet because what happens is when you get to prototyping, Everybody hits the restart button, and the so-called digital thread gets broken. Right? When you go from design to prototyping to manufacturing, the digital thread holding that together is broken in prototyping. And so the opportunity of going fast with a material that's got the properties to be a final product allows us to hold the digital thread from, pro from design to prototyping to manufacturing. And and, and there's so, so many things in low to medium volume manufacturing where this would be really game changing in, in, in time and, and cost savings. And you think about other things like high strength to weight ratio materials. These unit lattice structures, mechanical engineers have known for a long time the huge impact that this can have on, on strength of materials and low weight. 
but you can't make those things. Now you, now you really can with 3D manufacturing. You can't injection mold that kind of simple lattice. So you think about all the, ch all the seats in an airplane made out of something that's really strong and lightweight and how much energy savings. Or imagine a crush zone on a car to dissipate energy to protect passengers in design engineered ways. Really opens up these kinds of applications. As was mentioned, I, I started a biodegradable stent company, and we have stents in about 80,000 people today. It's, uh, it's driven by Abbott. Um, but those stents, so these are all made in our printer. Uh, the stents back in, uh, 15 years ago were traditional stents in that you had particular size stents, right? If you, <clears throat> if you have a blockage, and, and, and the interventional cardiologist decides you need, you know, one or two or three more or stents to deal with that blockage, uh, the interventional cardiologist sees the makeup and you've got kinks and tributaries and, she, and the interventional cardiologist, she may go to the, to the shelf and grab two or three different stents of different sizes, different diameters, and she puts them in. And it's sort of a Rube Goldberg solution to your blockage. Well, I think what can happen now is that, you know, through imaging, that you can have a stent designed for your own anatomy. Right? And it can be printed you know, in real time while you're even on the cath table. And the software can calculate where it needs to be hard and soft and where you got kinks. And so this could open up entire new approaches. Now, I wouldn't want to drive that by myself through the FDA. <laughs> right? I think that's a, that's, a, that's a big idea that's probably a long way off. But those things can happen now. Uh, think about porous materials and porous materials in medical devices. Every porous material is like a, or porous, any device that's got porosity is like a snowflake. If that was made by some gas injection system or some coagulation of particles, each one of those products is different. The FDA hates that. Right? What's great about porosity from a CAD file is every one of those are identical. And so again, the opportunity to raise the bar and really address scientific questions or engineering questions or clinical questions by having reproducibility and porosity <coughs> is another big idea. Um, and point of service manufacturing. There's 90,000 dental offices in the United States. The idea of fabricating these kinds of impressions, digital dentistry is just taking off. The idea of impressions you know, is old school. People have these blue light scanners. Right? We can make these sets of teeth in six and a half minutes. And it's normally hours to make those. And so it's real time while you're in the dentist chair that you could do these kinds of things. And then the things that I'm really excited about, these are some things my students at UNC and NC State are making. You know, you think about from a fabrication point of view, you know, the world's really good at making nanoscale things. I showed you print and imprint lithography and microelectronics. You know, the first Moore's Law, if you go to the beginning of Moore's Law back in the late and early 60s, the minimum feature size was 10 microns of transistors, and now people have driven that down to 10 nanometers, right? But to go from 10 microns to 2,000 microns is really, really hard to fabricate stuff. Really hard. People are trying to use the microelectronics fabrication tools and go up. And they're costly and they're really slow. To make something that's 2,000 microns tall, you'd have to start with a silicon wafer that's two millimeters thick. You'd have to put it in your etcher for hours, right? And you really can't make all the things you want of all the different geometries. Etching, a subtractive manufacturing technique, is really complicated. But these really delicate things that are grown without layers, I argue you can't make these uh, very easily by other techniques. And, and to make these structures with undercut structures or put one of these shapes right next to one of those shapes, you couldn't do that by etching. But it's really easy. And these take 90 seconds to make. And uh, these, these are microneedles for transdermal drug delivery. And the tips on these have a 1.25 micron diameter. Right? And so these are some of the sharpest kinds of microneedles that can be made out of biodegradable material, a water-soluble thing, or water-soluble material. We've been able to put biologics into these microneedles, small molecules, and there's a whole host of applications emerging for transdermal drug delivery of these kinds of technologies. So a huge opportunity with this new tool, I think. And uh, back to branding, clip. 
uh, allows anyone to produce commercial quality parts at game changing speeds and we're really focused on this creating this, this path to 3D manufacturing. And when you think about that, um, this is 3D printing today relative to injection molding. It's an exciting industry. It's about three and a half billion dollars growing a lot. But this is injection molding. And the idea that one could create a new category of 3D manufacturing. And uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish uh, with, uh, with the new company. And I'm privileged to work with an amazing group of uh, talented people uh, moving this technology forward and just a great group of uh, people in different companies. Uh, we've got about 55 employees in Redwood City. I love Redwood City's uh, moniker. It says, best, best climate by government test. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently in the 1900s, they, they're, the, they're the third best climate. It was the uh, Canary Islands, the northern coast of Africa, and Redwood City. <laughs> That's a good bill. Uh, but we've, got, we've raised about $50 million. We've got an amazing group of uh, investors and, and uh, Sequoia Capital, Silver Lake. Um, we've got machines in the field going through their testing, and we expect uh, launching uh, within a year. So this is our company. And uh, again, it's this convergence of different disciplines coming forward that we're very excited about. So anyway, thank you for your attention and happy <laughs>
the, the creeping of the materials that are often used here. Um, that's a materials issue. And um, with great materials, that doesn't happen. Uh, does it have any size limitation? It does. I mean, we put a lot of light uh, on the build surface, and so you think about a DLP, and you think about pixel size and the trade-off of light intensity. And so, you know, there are some, you know, lim and, but you know, you, you go to Dallas Cowboy Stadium; those are some big projectors there, right? So, you know, the idea of of uh, getting the resolution that one needs with the light intensity for the kinds of chemistry. There, so there is trade-off there. Uh, you see this, the one of the stages of Ted was a three inch by four inch, so fairly small. Yeah? Uh, you still have a, a 2D interface that you're working at. We do. Yeah. Are you planning on moving beyond that? I'm, I'm uh, Mr. Uh, the question is, are you working on any uh, way of um, imaging in 3D and creating parts that way as opposed to a the sort of choreography of an active surface going on. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some interesting things out there with holography and other things that people are doing in a vat of liquid, um, where you're you're trying to do something all at once with light. I think there's some great opportunities there. Um, you got to think about implementation of that um, with you know everything embedded in liquid while you're doing it. But I, I think there's some exciting opportunities there. That's not the way we're doing it. Obviously. Is there any difference in how the, polymer, the resin polymerizes between the interface at the oxygen permeable membrane and then the air surface interface? So, you know, yeah, so <clears throat> there's a lot of similarities. So, you know, in class, in polymer chemi chemistry classes, if we, you know, teach uh, a lot in coatings, you know, if you're going to coat uh, this wood here with an acrylic coating, and you lay down a, shin, a thin layer of uh, acrylic, and you're going to photo, you choose to photochemically cure it, and you do it in air. What will happen is uh, that top layer will be oily, and it will be cured underneath for the same exact reason. And you know, so it's that simple knowledge that you know oxygen inhibits that. And so, if you wanted to do that, you would <coughs> flush out the, the air in the room for nitrogen, or you put some sort of coat, you know, cover on that to avoid that. So. So there is a gradient. You think about this as a gradient of polymerization and different degrees of uh, oligomers as you go in the z-axis. And so there's, there's, there's got to be an, an interphase from the solid to the oligomers to the unreacted system. And then you certainly have the oxygen quench products there, too. That answers your question. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you pull down from the surface without using the membrane. Yeah, you can with the right viscosities. I mean, I think there's examples of that uh, on the internet and stuff. But you know, every all the top-down SL most SLAs operate that way, and they have uh, they start off with a vat, and they, they have like they push it into the system, and they have a wiper blade because of the viscosity of the resin and the interfacial tension between the resin and the part. So if your resin's got low enough viscosity, there's ways of, of driving that. But, you know, we're working some really viscous systems that make that difficult. Yeah, yeah, I was just curious in the gradient of oligomer density as you solidify the top. Uh -huh. Do you get structural instabilities? Uh, you know, I'm sure we do. Um, I can't wait to do some neutron reflectivity experiments <laughs> uh, at that interface. And so, you know, we're talking about, you know, ways of interrogating that surface, that interface or the interface, and study what, you know, all the details of that process. Because typically when you induce a phase transition, you would develop a crack instability that will propagate, right? Yeah, no, I mean, you can, we, we're watching this optically. We'd love to walk, look at it with better precision. Yeah. But yeah, you can, you can run this in a way where it doesn't work. Yeah. And you can see those instabilities and lead to defects in your parts, for sure. Mm -hmm. Most people don't want to do that, but you can <laughs> see that. And so to try to avoid those regions, regimes. Yeah. Thank you very much for this beautiful presentation. Um, one of the things that we're doing here in the team facility is printing skulls for spinal cord for surgical planning. Um, kind of bend the slate on it and we do the surgery in it. But what we discovered is that what we're doing now is printing it in biphasic. So for some of it will be um, rigid and some of it will be 
flexible. For example, if, when we print the TM joint area, you know, I can still open the skull or the spinal cord, I can still bend it. Because yeah. Would that be something that... Not easily. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, those, those deposition pro technologies work better with that. Okay. Where you can think about five colors or five different materials. Yeah. yeah. They, they work, you know, right now I'm showing you one, one resin. Mm -hmm. We certainly have switched out the resin during a build in the z-axis, but that's not what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, so I think that I know there are a lot of questions. So we will have the reception, and uh, I think Dr. Desimone will be here, so uh, feel free to uh, uh, talk to him. And so before we finish, so I want to present a plan to uh, Dr. Tismon to recognize his contribution. So the fact is uh, the Department of Biomedical Engineering, UC Davis, recognized Joseph uh, Tismon, PhD, for outstanding contribution in the field of biomedical engineering. Maruni Bryan Lecture, uh, 2015. This is design and manufacture in the team lab at UC Davis. Awesome. <laughs>